Hello, and welcome to a field edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Rob Hirschfeld, and I am here from BlueCon in uh, Broomfield, Colorado, with some really exciting uh, people at the table. We actually have a group. Uh, the founding team from Blockchain Technology Partners is joining me. I'm going to allow them to do their own introductions so you can get the voices matched to the people. But they have some, some really interesting tech around blockchain, which we want to have a discussion in, and some open source technology, and we're going to pull in a couple of edge topics. So, Yes, uh, the clue is in the name, I guess, uh, Blockchain Technology Partners. This is Duncan Johnston Watt, uh, the CEO and co-founder. This is Kevin O'Donnell, Chief Strategy Officer. Hi, I'm Mike Zicardo, the lead blockchain engineer. So basically, Mike does all the work. Yes. <laughs> what, what would be great for me, I want you all to define blockchain a little bit. First, blockchain technology partners, what are you trying to accomplish in the pretty noisy space around blockchain? It's, it is very noisy, um, for sure. We are paid up members of the Hyperledger community, so which under the auspices of the Linux Foundation is really the go-to place for a number of open source projects that really focus on providing permissioned, dedicated blockchain platforms for business. So very much a group of technologies. There's one called Fabric, Hyperledger Fabric, which IBM has been promoting pretty heavily. Uh, there's one called Hyperledger Sortus, which we're mostly involved in, and we can talk about that. And then there's a number of tools around. So think of it as, as essentially um, very much geared towards dedicated, permissioned enterprise blockchain. So this is very different to you know the, the public blockchains, Bitcoin, uh, obviously running on one, and the Ethereum network or networks, since there are uh, a couple of those. I don't want to assume that people listening know blockchain. Sometimes okay. I like to make people do homework, but this is one of those cases where I think it's individualized enough that you know, how do you how do you define blockchain? I think it's interesting actually because the we each sort of emphasize different aspects when we do then we describe it to people and what it actually does. For me, it's and given my background in just large distributed systems. It's the distributed transaction logs based on uh, based on consensus, and that's a common feature to the applications that I've built out over in the past. So it's to me, it's a replacement for as a fundamental piece of infrastructure for any time you're doing something. You have to do a combination of, say, for instance, a zookeeper and a replication for a read-only replica of a database. That's a potential place where a blockchain for an enterprise sits in. There's a lot of other qualities that, that go onto it as well, but that's a really fundamental one to me. So the two key pieces you're describing: distributed transaction log mm -hmm. and consensus yeah so in a distributed transaction log that means you have multiple people writing into the log multiple writers multiple readers okay know. and then they have to synchronize that log and then the consensus piece is based on an algorithm based on multiple parties where where does consensus come from? so we're based on hyperledger sawtooth in our work now that's uh, actually mike's probably the better one to describe that than i but actually go ahead Mike. Sure. so we're working with hyperledger sawtooth and it uses something called proof of elapsed time, which is actually utilizing, so that's a great efficiency gain compared to heavy computation in like the Ethereum or blockchain network. And that comes from the fact that uh, so Intel open sourced Hyperledger Sawtooth uh, and it uses uh, the new SGX chips to, to do proof of elapsed time, which is basically uh, being able to provably, I suppose, ran, like, you know, randomly selecting a, an amount of time to wait and then wait that amount of time and then prove that you've waited that amount of time, and this is capable with the SGX chips. And basically that is in place of the expensive computation that comes from the public. So um, why, why is it important to be able to prove an elapsed time? I, it doesn't, I, so I, I sort of understand a distributed ledger. I understand consensus where multiple parties validate that something happened. Because essentially uh, it's non-deterministic when you wake up, then it's essentially a, 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 a very fair way of, of determining that one of us is going to do the validation this time around. Well, Next time around, it'd be somebody else, and so on and so I'll forth. I'll actually say, one of the key problems, whatever dealing with, sorry, whatever you're dealing with, any sort of shared transaction log of any sort as you go through, the ordering is one of the key things that happens. Everybody has to agree when the transactions are implied, are applied, in what order as they go through. It's one of the fundamental reasons why you need that consensus validation to agree, okay, this is the one that goes next, this is the one that goes after that. And then if everybody marches to the same beat, which is exactly what the proof does, right. then we get consistent data stuff, disparate geos the whole bit. 
So part, I mean, part of the challenge with this is in alternative ways to handle transactions, we usually end up with a central authority, mm -hmm. and everybody checks in and checks out with that central yeah, authority. Right. So the fundamental goal here with blockchain, it seems like in general, because I feel like there, we're, we're getting into a blockchain, there's a lot of different blockchain approaches, there's a lot of different benefits. Is there just sort of a common thread of this? We have multiple actors taking independent action without that central authority. That's is that the, the main thing somebody should hold into onto when they look I at think blockchain? The main thing is it's decentralized in that we will all have our our own copy, but that copy cannot be adulterated or, or, or messed with because you'll be called out if you try to do that. So rather than checking in and checking out of a centralized instead Everyone has a copy of, of the ledger um, and is in agreement about contents and the ordering onto that ledger. These are cryptographic ledgers. That means there's expense and time and effort into validating the ledger. I guess that's why we're talking about not everybody having to validate every 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 transaction right. cryptographically. Is that yeah, fair? and it's well, it's, that's the reason behind the proof of elapsed time as opposed to any other algorithm. It doesn't burn CPU cycles, doesn't burn electricity. Okay. It's just the clock as it goes through, so it's green in that sense. The thing I was going to mention is, is just to go back to the, the thing, yeah, multiple writers is a necessary thing. If you, yeah, as a quality for when you use it, if you if you can afford to centralize your rights and actually get that sort of essentially single thread writer to the database or whatnot, uh, and go through, then okay. But then you also are trusting a single point system, at least from an architectural standpoint, whether it's actually a single physical system or not is different. But that actually is a weakness in the architecture of the system. Like if you have a network of validators and a network of points where you can accept the rights in, then actually parts of the network can actually come in and go out and come in and leave and fail and do other things while still maintaining the integrity of the consensus and, and of the law and but continued operation. I guess this is one of the things I heard about Bitcoin. Oh. And, and granted, Bitcoin is not blockchain. Oh. But one of the things about Bitcoin is that you end up with um, some people or exchanges mm. that do a lot of computation. Right. And they could actually manipulate the currency by slowing transactions or not you know making the consensus not happen as quickly yeah i mean it's an, it's it's an issue in the public chains okay and particularly in the currencies and that there's a sort of vested interest in in messing with the, the chain to one degree or another we deal with permission chains and among consortias or even within a single enterprise where there's not quite the same motivation to try to mess with things as you and want. There there's is, like, there's there a vested interest in keeping everything fine. There right? is typically also uh, a knowledge of who is actually yeah. participating. So, you know, this is why enterprise likes the idea because you can actually basically, let's take healthcare for example. We're actually working on a project in the healthcare space. Uh, it's really important there that, um, that data, whether it's patient data or whether it's the output of things like MRI scans, um, et cetera, is all handled correctly. And in fact, in the case of the project that we're working on, it's not just about those scans, it's what's done to transform them into 3D graphical models from which they then derive 3D printed artifacts. So there's a lot of moving parts here. And in, in the healthcare space, it's not just me as the patient it, or, or the clinic that probably holds my data. It's also the process of, of transforming that, that data into something else, doing it in an anonymized way, tracking Basically, did that 3D uh, model or artifact go to the right surgeon? You know, I mean, you don't want the situation where somebody marks the left instead of the right side of your body and takes the wrong bit out. So let, uh, let me put the skeptic hat firmly sure. on because, I mean, I'm a hospital. I'm doing that work. I could have a centralized database mm -hmm. where every, every one of those actions is logged against the central database. It's fast. It's easy. It's known technology. Why add blockchain? Well, in this... In, in, Actually, Actually no, personally, I would just say you have a very optimistic view of how hospitals work. <laughs> <laughs> hospitals, particularly in, in, in the U.S., it's a very fragmented space. There are lots of good participants, um, you know, and, and I'm not, it's not just me saying this. If you look at sort of any of the uh, case studies out there, you know, it's one of the hot areas and hot topics besides financial services, precisely because there are so many moving parts. So as part of the use case here, we're, we're looking at nobody wants a centralized authority or for hospitals, there is no easy centralized authority to, to identify? I would say more in the U.S. particularly, more the latter. It's, it's interesting that it's still interesting in systems like the, the NHS and things like that where it's still distributed out. That's because it's a massive centralized system and everything does have to come in, but it's actually mm -hmm. distributed 
crossings, or at least there's a single authority on it. But in the United States, there's no single authority. It's very fragmented, and there's lots of people with vested interest in keeping the records in various ways, right? From insurance all the way down to his so are there, suppliers. Are there a block of use cases that make, so to speak, a block of use cases that make sense on that, for this? On that, I mean, you've got first-hand experience of, of this, I guess, Mike. So in terms of the kinds of use cases of transaction families and so on. So. Yeah. So you're asking specifically which ones you think we're trying to target right now? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I suppose, based on what we've talked to, managing in the insurance space, right, managing basically both customer information and being able to track through, I guess, claims and, and every step of the way. Policies. through this. Yes. Mm-hmm. So in the insurance space, we saw one of those. Can you help me describe the one? Pause. The, post-processing. Yeah. <laughs> um, KYC type thing. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. So that's a more specialized client for KYC area is what it is, where there's an enormous amount of documentation that goes and gets set up to an identified person or entity. And it comes from different sources, it comes at different times, but you both need to build up a picture, which sounds like a normal database. Mm-hmm. But then things need to happen if new information comes up. That information is constantly changing. So if there's a reputation that shows up, it's the reputation mark against a legal entity that's bad, and then therefore you know, financial institutions or, or payment systems or whatnot all have to respond to that according to their policy. But that information comes from a number of a dozen systems, right? So it's, that's another sort of multiple writer scenario. And always, while the interesting bit is the final customer that gets value out of the system with KYC actually isn't interested in doing writing. They're looking so, at viewing it. Actually, that shows up a bunch, actually. So is part of this algorithm that every all the writers are always informed about changes to what's going on in the They always can be. They don't necessarily have to be. So they can subscribe yeah. to updates. Yeah. So, so it, it's not so part of it is that there's a publication mm-hmm. component. But I don't usually hear blockchain described with a publication yeah. piece <laughs> or a subscription piece, yeah, I because guess. Because people I think, you know, in do it with voodoo and you know, it's mid, it's middleware. <laughs> it's basically middleware. And you know, we've been doing middleware sometimes well, sometimes badly, for as long as I can remember. And um, I think, you know, there, there are a classic use case. Uh, by the way, these are use cases in the in, in, in blockchain generally. Not, we're not involved in every single one of these. But the classic one is, is any supply chain where there are multiple parties. Um, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for fraudulent behavior. Um, so think of the fresh produce supply chain. You know, there are some sophisticated participants in that who clearly have a reputational risk if they mess with things. You know, some of the yeah, some of the large right. aggregators that are then feeding uh, stuff into the WalMarts and, and so on. But at the other end, it's pretty hokey. And so hokey, hokey, yes, isn't that a word? It is definitely <laughs> a word. Yes. Um, in other words, it's it sounds too, charming when you say it. Though. It's, it's <laughs> too. It's too well. It's too tempting in some ways to to, to fudge the way bill and. You know, uh, you, you know, deliver quote more strawberries from the field than you actually did, and all this kind of stuff. So, okay. you know, that's that is probably one of the best known use cases, along with anything to do with provenance. So, Everledger, which is a company that's made its name uh, ensuring that you're not dealing in blood diamonds, has come up with a very sophisticated way of identifying a diamond and then essentially tracking its provenance. And if if something doesn't have the requisite provenance, it's like a stolen painting. You know, it's you could try selling it, but you're not going to get a decent price for it because you know there's no there's no chain of ownership. Or and, chain of and are people so that to me has always been a trusted authority type of thing where you would hire a professional broker or you'd hire some. You know, the, the, I guess the, the word case. broker is, is was, exactly what that means. Right? That was the case in the diamond industry, and but it's it's no longer a case that it's it's so tightly controlled. I mean, you know, yeah, you know a lot about these things. Nah, so. That's just, yeah, just the, the gears there. They no longer have the dominant monopoly that they used to. Mostly voluntarily. So, I mean, it used to be just they all came from them. You had to trust what they did. Now it's many different providers, many different lines. Many different so it's part of that disintermediation. Yeah. Like it, it happens to them. They, the entire way they do doing business for the last 80 some odd years or however long has just changed entirely. Divested and went into general mining. So does does the disintermediation mean that we can then transact faster? Is that part of the goal? Or is it reduce cost? Where's the reduce cost? I would definitely say by right. reducing errors and also making it very clear. I mean, there is a part where, particularly in the supply chain things, where it sort of slots in place where 
the granddaddy EDI SAC in terms of data formats that can that kind of mediate transactions between companies and consortia. But it's uh, I mean, a great example is is a joint venture between IBM and Maersk. I mean, this is obviously the shipping, the shipping company, um, and they reckon that they can you know, improve the efficiency by something of the order of twenty or twenty five percent. And given how big of an industry that that's is, a that's a massive yeah. saving, right? So and not just saving cost, but actually improving the overall delivery of of the service per se. Yeah, what was ten years ago? If you got stuff shipped by actual container ship, it was like something like a ten percent chance that the stuff was just never going to show up at all. That sounds like <laughs> a right. so there's there's a loss, and then yeah, I remember uh, Jenny Romney at, yeah. at IBM. Um, I think yeah, I think was saying there's a huge amount of cost just in the paperwork yep. that goes around behind shipping. Yep. Um, so so if you can if you can weed that out, but and and at the same time produce a more reliable system where it's it's not frankly open to fraud, um, where everyone who's participating in this uh, in this sort of in this case shipping uh, process uh, has a very clear view of, of what they are allowed to see. It's not that the stuff has to be completely transparent. There are ways of actually ring fencing the critical data and just dealing with if you like the headline uh, headline information. But it's enough to ensure that you know the chain of custody is. Does what it says on the tin, and that's that was one of the things that, that really surprised me because we assume you know we go to the store we buy something we, we don't really appreciate just how many different entities are involved with with getting that item all the way from production and in, and then in some cases we're going all the way back to raw materials right so For sure yeah. so if I'm buying a, a ring at the store right the source of the diamonds the source of the minerals the you know everything matters I do just put my critical hat on. I do think one of the interesting things about the supply chain thing is that it really has to supply chain of hard goods really has to get very integrated down to the physical aspect of things. I just remember, and it's not is it the shipping thing just makes me think of it. Ten years ago, there was a a strike in Long Beach for the, in the longshoremen's union because they were they were put through a thick policy where they were considering minorly computerizing the. The loading and unloading of ships, and they so went on. One so they went on strike for a yeah. week, and it's the largest port in the United States. Cut down. You like you, you immediately felt the effect that you couldn't get various things at all for a while. Right? Yeah, uh, but it's that, they're very that they're very limited. Is a huge thing. A, a, a project we are involved in, which is probably not a dinner table conversation, is is handling clinical waste. Yeah. Okay. So you'll appreciate that's quite an important thing to get right because oftentimes. You know, it's it maybe infectious, it may be you know, dangerous, dangerous in one way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. uh, or another. And so, you absolutely want to uh, make sure that, that process is, is as locked down as it can be. You can't do that at the level of an individual hospital. You know, that frankly doesn't work because uh, a lot of times there's specialist disposal that's required, and you're not going to have every hospital having its own specialized disposal machine to somehow turn us into sort of inert, uh, you know. Uh, powder, etc. So, so, and these things are expensive. Um, so you and and you're dealing with people that aren't necessarily it's not their speciality handling this stuff. You know, they're, they're not always going to be the sort of high end. They're going to be orderlies. They're going to be you know people who are you know basically doing a good job, but you know they need a process and they need some structure around that. Um, so I think you know these are these are I think really interesting areas where you're actually adding real value. So let me let me pivot it to sure. a topic that we like to cover, and if we can't go that deep, I'm, I understand. But edge, do you, do you, you know, edge is a distributed environment, right? When we look at what edge means, it means that we're really talking about highly distributed, decentralized mm -hmm. IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's some interesting stuff happening there. Okay. I don't know if you've come across the um, trusted IoT alliance. No. Okay. So Joe Pindar, a good friend of ours, is involved in that he's with Jamalto. It's definitely worth having a look at that because that's trying to bring together ideas around blockchain together with IoT together with obviously very much stuff at the edge. So IoT in, in, in this case is the actual edge network, the sensors, the data that's mm -hmm. coming yeah. together. It's 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 a combination. It's is this sensor what it purports to be? So there's mm -hmm. a there's a need to validate that. Um, so that you're not getting fake data coming from un un unlicensed uh, sensors that have just popped in and started you know, spraying data around the place. 
and then also it's covering the actual you know management of the data itself. Well, one of the use cases that that I have been sort of investigating from an edge perspective is that we have a lot of sensors coming into people's homes, a lot of devices mm -hmm. that are IoT infrastructure that are not single vendor. They're not mm -hmm. single platform. They're they're homing to different cloud infrastructures. They're not localized, right? So I could in my in my home have a hundred devices reporting to you know, tens of clouds because even if it's you know they all went to Amazon they could be going to different regions they could some of them start zones. laughing manically when you're not expecting they, them. they could do <laughs> those all go to Amazon but uh, yes <laughs> I mean but we have this this providence of we buy we buy machine, buy systems we're putting them in our house and increasingly they're going to have to co coordinate their data share that information it's my data yeah is there a blockchain application in that well, it should be your data You've actually signed away your life. <laughs> all right, it's somebody else. But, I mean, I'm borrowing it back. For, thing, right? you, have all, you have all this sensor data. You know the you unpacking can... of the, the the TV. You agree to, but I mean, what? you you sign up for these services and things like that. Like if it did go to some personal entity on a blockchain, whether it's for your house or whether there's some public thing, and then you had a certain level of control of what all that data goes through and withdraw it. That's the tricky part, right? I don't think people would stop giving away data for free services, but problem is that it's very opaque how to withdraw that access to the information. Right? So, yeah, this is not really a blockchain thing so much as uh, an industry a shift tip. that, you know, this notion that uh, IBM talk about data responsibility being mm -hmm. something that we are all responsible for. It's not just something you can delegate. Um, and the work that people like Val, Val is doing with Pencil Data and, and the initiative that he's trying to drive. Um, which is definitely worth taking a look at. Um, the idea there is that um, it's almost uh, inconceivable to stop things and say, hey, all right, let's re reprogram everything. But there is a, there's an increasing awareness that there is onus on companies to, to, uh, to be more explicit about what they're doing. And there's an onus on you as the individual or the entity might be a corporation to no, there's, to there's this. still different. That's not just Jimmy. There's I mean there's there's Paul Wendley and the the sovereign guys. Yeah. And self sovereign idea. And that's just the identity part. That's not this but why not extend that same idea of having control over to general information that you're having collected in I think yeah. I, see, yeah. I see an opportunity though to keep the data more local, right? Part of mm -hmm. to the edge right, edge IT. Or even why not have a side chain for everybody's house and it's just mine. I know what happens to it. Well, because I don't, if I'm processing, if I have my sensors going data back to Google mm -hmm. and, you know, cross-connecting that set that data into, because you know, I'm using Nest mm -hmm. and I have, you know, um, a refrigerator that's talking to something in Microsoft's cloud and I want them to actually share just information. To talk together and work and coordinate. Yeah, there's a, there's a total thing to that, like to just have a better coordinated, integrated home environment. So what is it going mean, to take for, for those vendors? <laughs> It, well, for those vendors to then say, "Oh, I'm going to participate in Rob Hirschfeld's blockchain, mm -hmm. like home blockchain," is that is that a thing they could do? They could actually start publishing data into a shared environment where where there's multiple you writers. You absolutely can do it. Okay. I mean, it's whether there's a will and a commercial, commercially viable option to do. It. Would Would that make it easier for a developer to create a home experience absolutely. on top of all that data? Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly because what you're describing is like, oh, I. I kind of like to have a unified view. I've got Nest as well. I'd like to see a unified view and how does that compare with what Nest, Nest responding to my net admin stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of all the home sensors. I'm sure, sure I've got everything. <laughs> the, but like have all that and see what they're doing, right? Because on the other hand, they also all, just for just purely tech nerd stuff, see whether they're all calibrating and actually reading the same thing and responding the same way or one of them off. And I need to adjust how it behaves and things like that. But yeah, there's absolutely thing. From that, build applications on it, build the services on it to just do scenes and stuff like that. I mean, if you do lighting and all this stuff, which I do as well, the the lighting scene stuff is still surprisingly primitive, and that's actually like the whole oldest home automation thing. I wonder then if if the data, maybe I'm not sure about the incentives for the companies, but for a user experience, if data being collected by these different disparate company products, you got a Google, you got Google this thing, you got an Amazon, whatever, if they're able to somehow be able to be Combine into some kind of API or batch or something, yeah. it would allow them to be able to coordinate better. Like, okay, if you've, I don't know, I thought of a funny joke at first. This is a dumb example, but maybe if you like 
raise the temperature. Like if the nest temperature went up, then Echo could play some song about like heat or something. I think mean, it's a dumb example. But the thing is like, <laughs> no, if not at sense, all. If like, exactly you know, like uh, hot right. in here by now, by what was it by again? Like, yeah, if, if, if nest raises temperature, the thing is like these things right now, I doubt they're able to talk to each other. But if, if, if they were, I'm not exactly sure the mechanism, but if they were, if there was some combined, uh, if this, it's a sensor information based on maybe you opting in could be shared across, okay, then sure. absolutely it could, it could, it could probably make the experience better. Based so on what do is, uh, IFTTT. I, lo- I love that, right? But it's actually it's <laughs> they're doing polling and that's various APIs. You have to mm-hmm. give IFTTT the keys to every account you have, but it's fantastic, <laughs> right? But that's to do that kind of thing is that's why you use it. Right? This, I mean, and the thing the thing that we've been exploring, you know, for people who've been listening to the the podcast as we go, that there's a clear pattern emerging of data providence, mm-hmm. data distribution. Right, data coordination mm-hmm. in in edge because it's every individual is you know, is going to have data that's going to be accumulated from that perspective. So, and related to that, and you're right, data provenance, data responsibility, and um, I was blanking, but it's Val Berkovici that I'm yeah. talking about. I'll, I'll, and I, Val, I'm, Val, I'm going to get you on the show because he and I have talked blockchain to. pretty deeply. Yeah. Yep, you have to. There's also this notion of tokenizing your data, so mm-hmm. being rewarded for sharing. Which is flipping things on its head, where instead of people just assuming they have every right to your data because you signed your life away when you bought something online or whatever, it's actually it's actually reversing that, saying no, actually, I will boast some aspect of of it, but in return, I expect to get something back. So, so Brave Net or whatever that was going on, Brave Brave browser, Brave browser, but I mean it's it's a theme that's so emerging. So yeah. if we're talking themes here, the tokenizing of the economy is a big thing, but if you actually boil it down to let's look at uh, tokenizing specific things like uh, personal data, then it becomes more tractable. What I'm not a fan of, by the way, and there are, you know, there's any number of ICOs which I would sort of give a wide berth to, like proof of exercise. <laughs> there is, I swear to God, that could be a proof, proof of sweat. Right? That, <laughs> this, this is a go and look, Jim Rewards.io or something. Yeah, they were be. saying, you will earn more Jim tokens if you exercise so i'm like that sounds like i'm now on this machine i'm gonna die because i'm a hamster and i'm just going 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 considering my spouse's relationship uh with the apple watch i can completely see it well, and closing kind of the sound, rings the black mirror episode where you have to like, oh, right. to ride the bike to get the tokens to like live your life to get the points it makes yeah. a lot of sense oh. so wow. I, we're, we're we're gonna lose the room in a, in a moment or two um we have a little bit of time to just have you describe your open source project, and I'm I'm always interested in in why you chose an open source business model for the tech that you chose to put in, in open. High level, we are, to so at the highest level, blockchain technology partners has created um, a a reusable platform that's aimed primarily today at developers, making it easy for them to stand up an environment in which they can then experiment. So as you know, at Rack N and so forth. There is so much goes on behind the scenes that really you want to make, uh, simplify or eliminate. So this is a developer conference. Developers should be writing you know, smart contracts, stuff like that, not trying to stand up environments. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 at the core, what we've done is taken, um, you know, elements of sort to some sort of systems that go along with that, and and using that like Brooklyn, um, automated deployment. Of that. Okay. Um, there's plenty more that we can do, but we stopped at deployment in order to open source it and give it to people early so they can experiment themselves. And most importantly, because Sawtooth supports Ethereum, they can use the same tool chain they're used to using when they're actually sort of programming against the Ethereum network or one of the test nets. So that you get your own dedicated test net, if you will, um, and you can experiment with that. Longer term, business model wise, of course, we want to provide an operational envelope around that, hardening it. In order to make it more consumable by enterprise, by business in, in you know, production in environments, and longer term, I think you know, provide it as a service where people want you know us to take care of everything. Um, and there is this sort of you know, people get all bent out of shape about wait a minute, whoa, it's suddenly centralized again. No, the operations uh, can be can be uh, federated, but in general, operations is done sensibly. Uh, that's different to the applications. The applications are as decentralized and as peer to peer as you like. Yeah. But, you know, as you can appreciate, having everyone being an operator is, 
a recipe for disaster. I, it, it adds, it's a very hard thing. You have to decide when you want to be an operator to do it, right? right. This is, as much as we are a, a on-premises infrastructure company, we believe SaaS and cloud are great distribution models. Yep. Um, and they have their, you know, their, have their dominant place in the market. So the interesting thing, I think, from the point of view of the founding team, is we're, we're taking a lot of stuff that exists today. We're, our know-how is being used to package it up. Uh, we're making it available. We're making it openly available through open source. We want to contribute to what we've done to the Hyperledger project itself so that it's available not just um, you know, on our repo, but actually it's integrated into the Hyperledger. And then if you look at the experience around the table, uh, you know, you've got Mike, who's been heavily involved in Hyperledger in the community for the you know, past two plus years. Kevin, I've worked with, uh, well, I've worked with Mike on the Hyperledger stuff in the past, but Kevin's got tremendous experience, you know, decades of experience around operations and automation and so on. Um, and I make the tea, you know, so <laughs> badly. I appreciate it. I, 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 I empathize with that role. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. This was great. I appreciate the time. Uh, we're definitely losing the room, so. Thank you very much. Where can, where can people get a little more information? But blockchaintp.com. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Yep.